I do want to break from format a little bit just to thank the program committee and uh, my advisor and co-authors and then many of the innumerable individuals throughout uh, government and the U.S. court system that have helped um, to fix kind of the problems presented here. Uh, I think without the efforts of all of these individuals, I would not be here today. So I just wanted to, to provide a thank you. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm here to talk about how PDF redaction is broken. Um, and actually, like probably two minutes before the talk, they probably saw me, I was really inclined to show like top secret documents and like US court cases that were had redacted content, but I've decided not to do that <laughs> um, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, so in the couple minutes leading up to this, I created these fake synthetic redactions. Uh, these are of my name, just disclosure. And I was wondering if like we think these are secure. Um, and maybe the obvious answer is, uh, no, no, none of these are secure. The, the top one is probably pretty easy to see how it's not secure because the number of widths in uh, the number of like last names or number of first names is pretty uh, unique, right? The letter L is thinner than the letter M, et cetera. Um, but when it comes to longer redactions, I think the general consensus up to this point in time is that if it's like two words long or even longer, that it's, that it's secure. And so we're going to be talking in this talk about why it's fundamentally um, not secure. And it has to do with a lot of interesting facets of the PDF standard. So just kind of motivating it, right? We don't know what this image is of, but if I show you a little bit more of it, you might like start to understand, oh, well, it's an image of something and maybe the definition of a chair and then if I show you a photograph and maybe reveal a little bit of the top of the middle object now, we have pretty good reason to believe that that's a chair based upon the surrounding information that has not been redacted. Um, so let's talk just very briefly. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with sort of copy-paste style redactions where you change the background of the text to the color black, but you can still highlight it, press control C, press control V. Um, and we studied these, and actually these are a huge problem. Um, there's like thousands of these in the US court system, including trade secrets and information about celebrities. But uh, the ones that we'll be talking about technically in this talk are the uh, excising redactions. And the excising redactions are those that remove the characters, the underlying glyphs from the PDF. Um, and this is actually, we'll talk briefly, and I'll try to mention rasterization, but I first want to talk about how documents get laid out and how text is laid out inside PDF documents. Because fundamentally, right, we need to understand how the, speci how the text and the layout of text on the page is specified before we can begin to talk about how it would then be printed out by a printer, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, and for understanding these specific information leaks, I'll be talking briefly about width and shift equivalence classes. So width equivalence. Let's talk about like a monospaced font. You have the word she, three letters, versus the word he, which is two letters. If you have a redaction of that word and you have reason to believe that it is a pronoun, then it's pretty easy to distinguish between she and he when it's redacted based upon width alone so long as the text underneath the redaction has not been changed prior to redaction. Um, and it's, this generalizes to proportional fonts. So as I mentioned, the letter L is thinner than the letter M. So, so you can imagine that that might give you slightly more information than just knowing the number of characters in the, in the redacted phrase. But this story gets really complicated really quickly once you start looking at uh, real PDF documents because PDF documents include these positional adjustments to characters and these are, it's uh, hard to understate the universality of these throughout different PDF production workflows. So if you save a PDF from an email or you produce it using Microsoft Word, it's likely to end up with these positional adjustments. Each one of these is, as the slide says, right, a thousand of these units is uh, equals point size of the font times one seventy second of an inch. So these are incredibly small, um, sometimes at the subpixel level. So they're almost imperceptible until you throw a computer at the problem. Um, and it's also critical to understand, uh, and I'll say briefly that that the positional adjustments 
can affect the width of a redaction. So it's not enough to just look at the true type font width if you're attempting to break a redaction in a PDF document. You actually need to understand something about these shifts. And the benefit that you get there is that the shifts actually delineate to a greater extent the redacted content than the, width, the true type font width alone. Um, and certainly there's documents without these shifts. And so um, the, those I'll refer to as, as unadjusted. Um, so the prior work on this was uh, work by Nakash and Whelan. I'm, hope I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. And that was analyzed by Lopresti and Spitz back in 2004. And since then, there's been like no research on this topic. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, no academic research. I think there's been a lot of government interest in this topic, and I think that there's been a lot of sort of industry, uh, third-party interest in the, in the topic. Um, but the original report just looked at sort of TTF width, and this is their report for countries, and it sort of generalizes across the results. So out of 416 country names that they uh, analyzed, they found that there were sort of 238 uniquely identifiable uh, width entries from, from the text. And so by considering these positional adjustments for Microsoft Word in Calibri font, I believe 11 point, we then can actually significantly get much better results. So for 550 different country name formats considered, 507 were uniquely identifiable using, using knowledge of these, how these positional uh, shifting schemes manifest for a Microsoft Word document. Um, and I think it just it goes to demonstrate that like information leaks are more of like an interconnected system than a single sort of uh, basis that you can you can look at. So just understanding something about the font is not enough. We really have to be careful and really understand the context in which that font is used. So, of course, like one aspect of this is fine if these shifts in the non-redacted text are completely independent of the redacted text content. So, so if, uh, if you have a non-redacted word and the shifts for that word don't depend on the content or the text of the redacted word, then that's fine. In practice, this is not the case. And it's especially not the case for Microsoft Word. So Microsoft Word converts from an internal GKI API uh, coordinate system, and it converts that to PDF. It does an error accumulation algorithm. And so actually, the text content of every single letter on a line for a proportional font like Times New Roman or Calibri can affect uh, the, the positional shifts across the, across the line. And that means that redacted text information leaks out through these positional, te uh, positional adjustments to non-redacted text information. Um, and bri briefly, I want to say like, the process of, of building these uh, attacks and then later defenses. So to, to get an accurate measure of the PDF standard, I just want to say thank you to the Poplar devs, the like, standard Linux PDF library. Things, these, they're awesome. Uh, and then also the analysis of Microsoft Word to model the shifting schemes was Windows Debugger. The preview feature, the time travel debugging, absolutely thank you for doing that, and Ghidra devs, of course. So you just essentially go into the software, you reverse engineer it, you figure out the scheme for generating the positional adjustments, and then you use that to attack documents. Um, but none of this would matter if uh, this information were completely removed by redaction tools, right? So redaction tools could be removing these positional adjustments, converting the, face, the font to monospace, but of course they're not. And the majority preserve uh, width and shifts uh, to some, in some method by which it's possible to deduce what they were originally. Um, so those affected included um, certain workflows of Adobe Acrobat. So the default Adobe Acrobat redaction workflow does rasterize the document and it removes the shift inform We'll talk about rasters in a bit. It may be possible to recover the shift information from raster documents, but I, I'm kind of saving that until we understand that. Um, so, and then, Let's talk about like how many documents are vulnerable. Then this is a serious problem. So here we see the non-excised number. Of course, that's 710 court documents total had like in most cases entire blocks of text that were redacted in a way where you could just copy paste the text. Um, and since then, the, they've been notified and and lawyers have been contacted. So I'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about notification. Um, but it's also important to understand that like. Uh, Okay, so we have this potential attack on PDF, but how is it possible to actually leverage it in practice? And so we looked at Freedom of Information Act documents, Office of Inspector General documents, and Digital National Security Archives documents. Digital National Security Archives, of course, being documents of historical re re uh, relevance, including classified documents. 
And in these documents, um, we found a number of redacted PDFs uh, that were vulnerable to these attacks. We modeled the Microsoft Word adjustment algorithm, but of course, uh, more advanced attacks are possible. So, um, so that's kind of the extent of it. I won't go into maybe the uh, results just yet for attacking these documents. How good did we do? First, I'll talk about synthetic deredaction. So when you attack redaction, you, of course, have a dictionary. The dictionary is the possible terms that you want to consider for what the redacted content is. There's Cartesian doubt in this process, right? You can never know whether you've really tried everything, so we just try to capture as many possibilities as possible. Um, and uh, in this measure, there's uh, the number of bits of entropy, right? So that's 2 to the 32 point, uh, for the first name, last name, pairwise case, 2 to the 32, uh, 2 to the 23.1 uh, possibilities in that dictionary. And that's from uh, FN Ellen, in this case, is voter registration databases from three, three states, uh, North Carolina, Washington, and Ohio. And then we have the cross-product dictionary of all first names and last names from the Social Security Administration and U.S. Census. So here's our, here's our results, and I want to break them down. So on the left-hand side, we have the number of bits that we are able to uniquely distinguish after applying our attacks. And on the right, we have a probability of a correct guess. So given a number of matches, if the adversary guesses either at random or according to the empirical distribution of names in the population, this is their probability of, um, this is their probability of guessing the correct name. And these are synthetic. We like we essentially generated our own redacted documents, and then and then tested our attacks. Um, here's monospace. It doesn't do really well. Here's unadjusted without the shifts. It similarly does okay, but it doesn't do great in all cases. And then here's our attacks with the shifts. Of course, the bottom right is the one that is probably the most advanced adversary that's considering like this name occurs at this frequency in the population. And here we see that for voter registration databases, uh, in like 37% of cases, you can figure out uniquely or like, I guess, guess the correct name uh, from like the New York Times. So just to quickly wrap this up, um, so we then looked at real documents. We looked at a complete cross product of first names and last names. This is like 1.5 times 10 to the 10 possibilities. And on average, you're able to reduce the number of matches to uh, 2,000. So that's 2,000 potentialities for the redacted content, considering no, almost no prior information, just that you know that it is some first name, last name combination. Um, and of course, for Congress people, for countries, et cetera, you can, you can uh, just immediately break it. Um, so we notified everybody, uh, 22 different government agencies. We're actively working with US courts. And then in terms of defenses, there's lots of things we can talk about rasterization. And so on later, the, the takeaway is that rasterization itself is, not, is also not secure. OK, and that's everything. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to let the other people ask them, um, which is, do courts or governmental institutes use any redaction tools or techniques when releasing documents with sensitive or classified info? Yes. So there is an official NSA guideline, and the official NSA guideline is that you need to redu uh, re change the underlying text of the document before you redact it. And honestly, that seems to be the most like, legitimately secure way of doing this, either that or redacting just more of the text. But the majority of the tools that are in use today and majority of the awareness of the problem is it's it, people don't understand that one to two word redactions don't work. Um, so, and a lot of existing tools still preserve width and shift information. Okay, thank you. And then we'll catch up a little bit. So thank you uh, again. Thank our speaker.